Ideas are like living creatures. In the same way that carbon atoms collided to produce the first life forms on Earth, so too do ideas develop from the intersection of various thoughts. In order for such sparks to collide, though, the right environment must be established. In order to understand the ideal environment for idea generation, we must first define what exactly good ideas are made of. Ideas are made up of a network of neurons. When the right neurons fire in sync, a new idea is sparked. However, these neurons, or even the sparks that ignite them, may be located in two completely different minds. Thus, spaces where conversation can freely flow are the ideal setting for innovative thoughts to develop. Stephen Johnson, acclaimed author of Where Good Ideas Come From, describes such spaces as liquid networks. By definition, networks require connections, and in a liquid network, such connections are highly accessible and perpetually dynamic. A liquid network thrives on an informal setup. Participants must feel comfortable sharing thoughts openly, accepting critique, and building upon others' ideas. Thus, Johnson refers to such networks as plastic or able to be reshaped and reformed. Without this flexibility, liquid networks would become too rigid to be functional. Despite their flexibility and diversity, members of liquid networks do share a common goal. This is the core that ties members of the network together. For example, members may work for the same company, study the same field, or attend the same school. These common ties encourage socialization, and as Johnson notes, good ideas happen when people work together. Johnson's social innovation premise is supported by a 1990 study at McGill University showing that a majority of researchers' ideas come during casual laboratory meetings. Additional evidence shows that some of the best ideas come from interactions between diverse work groups, for example, workers from different departments or backgrounds that are collaborating together. In order for academic and professional settings to establish liquid networks, they must be able to accommodate a variety of situations. For this reason, many companies are moving away from earlier models of identical cubicles, which isolate employees. Such designs were intended to encourage individual productivity, but ultimately stifle creativity and the growth of ideas. Instead of traditional layouts, more and more companies are utilizing open plans in their offices. In these spaces, workers are not separated by rank or task, but rather can form and reform a variety of groups to best suit their current work. Such layouts can be facilitated by movable tables, mobile computers, and limited obstructive walls. To encourage further interaction, some experts have suggested building functional inefficiencies into workspaces. For example, forcing employees to share resources like copy machines and coffee makers. In doing this, people are required to more frequently interact and communicate as they utilize common spaces. Put more simply, water cooler chatter can breed innovation. Additionally, people who do not normally work together may be relocated to the same area. This encourages two important additions to the liquid network. First, people need to move around more to access those they need to speak with. Second, people naturally begin to speak with individuals with whom they previously had a limited or non-existent relationship. As a result of increased communication, liquid networks need to accommodate the flow of ideas by providing time and space for recording thoughts. Technology is a great asset in this area, as new hunches can be recorded easily on a cell phone or computer. However, some companies have become even more creative. For example, Microsoft developed an office with whiteboard walls. For companies, liquid networks combine physical infrastructure and social connections. These same principles, though, can be applied to schools in order to enhance students' learning. In an effort to determine the best layout to facilitate educational liquid networks, some schools have undertaken surveys to evaluate facilities and make suggestions on how to modify buildings to meet goals. These surveys have led to schools with flexible layouts that facilitate communication. For example, some schools include joint classrooms, designated space for cross-curricular projects, and tables and workstations instead of individual desks. Looking ahead, more innovative designs include movable walls, which can be modified to create new classrooms for various activities. Beyond the physical layout, teachers need to work as facilitators of liquid networks. This can be done by encouraging group activities. When students collaborate together, they are more likely to produce innovative thoughts. 
Group work should be varied with students working with a diversity of peers throughout the year. This can include cross-curricular projects and cross-grade level activities. Liquid networks can also develop outside the formal environments of schools and offices. Many great ideas have come from casual conversations with friends, acquaintances, and even strangers. Certain places in our environment foster such meetings. For example, the so-called coffee houses from 17th and 18th century Europe facilitated new philosophies and technologies. Today, diversity and population density have turned nearly every modern city into its own liquid network. Within a city, people from a broad range of beliefs, experiences, and ideas live in close proximity. Additionally, urban centers necessitate interaction through the use of public transportation and communal spaces. Overall, liquid networks provide a comfortable medium between two other interpersonal configurations evaluated by researchers, solid networks and gaseous networks. Solid networks can be compared to a series of chain links. Each segment is isolated with few connections to others. Members of each section share a strong identity that is rarely amenable to new ideas. In contrast, gaseous networks are too free-flowing to function efficiently. Such networks are highly flexible and willing to accept new thoughts. However, the constant shift towards new ideas often leads to a lack of focus and abandonment of previous work. Without appropriate filtering, a plethora of ideas leads to too little practical implementation. To remain productive, networks have to be both firm and flexible. In a liquid network, members are neither stubborn, as in solid networks, or flighty, as in gaseous networks. They are open to change and understand how to weave new ideas into existing frameworks. Bonds between members of liquid networks are strong enough to last, but malleable enough to adapt. Ultimately, liquid networks are environments where hunches connect. With the collision of partial ideas comes innovation. This cannot happen in isolation. Rather, as Johnson explains, great breakthroughs are closer to what happens in a floodplain. A dozen separate tributaries converge, and the rising waters lift the genius.